Well, good morning. Woohoo! This is loud. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you guys are having an awesome Sunday morning. I know a lot of our friends are on vacation. It's like National Sunday Vacation Day. But we're here and we're going to praise the Lord with everything we've got. Amen. God, you are so good. We welcome you into this house. Holy, holy, Father, you are holy. There is no one else like you. Voices need to come down. Faithful, faithful, Father, you are faithful. We have put our trust in you. Our God who reigns, our God who reigns, we praise your name. Praise to the only living God. Praise to the holy faithful one. Hallelujah, we praise your name.
you are so good. You are so good. Hallelujah. You know, we serve a faithful God. There is nothing our God cannot do. He is so mighty. And he loves you with every inch of you. Turn into light. Open the eyes of the mind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness we shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you.
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome and power. Our God, our God. Hallelujah. Oh, nothing can stand against us.
Now you fill me with the Holy Ghost And how you heal me, how you heal me to the uttermost Oh, when I think about, when I think about the Lord How He peeled me
Sometimes we're supposed to just be still and know that he is God. He is the God of our peace. He is the God of our salvation. He's the God of our provision. He's the God of our deliverance from strongholds. He's the God of your heart. He's the God of your mind if you will just let him. He, the God of your house if you will let him. He's the God of your computer if you will let him. But sometimes we just have to stop and accept it now. wants to deliver you and set you free. He wants to walk by your side and hold your hand. He does not want to leave you and he wants you to know that nothing can stand against you. Lord, we come to you today. I praise you, God, for being the God of everything to us. Whatever our need is, you have not forgotten us or you have not forsaken us. In the midst of our confusion or not understanding or our reluctancy to let go of the things that we think we love here on earth, you still love us and you still want to guide us and you want to protect us. And I pray, Father, that you will pierce our hearts in a way that we will let you protect us and watch over us. May we let go of trying to lead our own lives and, Lord, may we trust and have the faith enough to let you lead them for us. ways are higher than ours. We cannot understand them. And Lord, even though we think you are slow in acting, a day is like a thousand years to you, and a thousand years is like a day, and you have not forgotten your promises. They are yes and amen in the name of Jesus, according to your will and will. Lord, some people in here this morning just have questions, and I pray that you will be their answer giver, that you will be their peace speaker in the midst of the questions and in the midst of the doubts and the wonderings of where is God right now? You are right there, but sometimes you speak in such a sweet, small voice that we are too busy to listen. We've got to stop and be still and listen and realize that you are there loving us every step of the way, every step of our journey. Because nothing can stand against us. Because you are for us. You are for me. And sometimes what I see as defeat, you see as step one. Next. And we might feel defeat again, and you're like, nope, step two. Next.
because what you are designing is perfect and beautiful and when we get to the end of the steps then we're like oh oh dear god thank you thank you because often it's when we look back that we see the footprints that are walking by us because your promises are true i love you lord i pray god that you will continue to be in this service and that you will continue to speak to us in this place this morning. Lord, I lift up Pastor Jason as he brings the word here in just a few moments. Lord, let your anointing pour over him and through him. Speak to us. And may we obey. Not just listen, but obey. Give us the courage and the faith to do so. We give it over to you this morning. In your holy, precious name I pray. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Woo! God is so good, I'm feeling good. I came sleepy this morning, and I'm not anymore. Woo! God can energize you really quick. Why don't you just hug your neighbor and say, it's only just beginning. God has got something awesome today. There's a lot of neck hugging. Hug your neighbor, find your seat. Welcome to Faith Assembly, this beautiful, not raining, sunny, beautiful day outside. My grass is very happy. It got its rain and now it's getting its sunshine. It's a beautiful day. If my section greeters could stand up, that would be awesome. If you are visiting with us this morning, could you raise your hand? We would love to say hello. We're so glad there's some right over here in the middle section. Over to my right, right here. Wonderful, and some over here, and some in the back, way back there. Welcome to Faith this morning. We're glad that you're here. Our section greeters will give you a little welcome packet, and there's a little card in there. If you could fill it out so that we could just say hi. We're excited that you're here. And also, if you have a prayer need this morning, these same section greeters have a wonderful prayer request form. We would love to pray with you. And also, if you have a praise report, something that God has done amazing in your life, we'd like to celebrate with you as well. All right, I have a couple announcements this morning. 55 plus this Tuesday is having their bingo luncheon. Starts at 1030 for bingo, and then at 1230 they're having lunch. So come on out. Have fun with the 55 plus. Sounds like a fun time. I might sneak in. All right, if you are a teenager, we are going to Splashtown this Thursday. I know it got rained out a couple weeks ago, but we're going this Thursday. If you've not signed up, please come see Pastor Roger and I. We're leaving at 9 a.m. around there uh, Thursday morning. Um, So sign up for that. It should be a lot of fun. Also, our Summer Life PM classes on Sunday night are still going on, and I'm hearing amazing things about what God is doing in each and every class. We're trying to have classes that meet everybody's individual needs from small child all the way up. So if you look around in your bulletin and stuff and talk to people around, you say, hey, what class is really cool? What are you having fun time with? And be here on Sunday night to enjoy our summer life classes. All right, it's time for offering. Pastor Jason. Good morning. I had turned on the microphone. I think there's a little video. I wanted to give you a little skinny on uh, the offering and kind of how that works. Do you think we could show that video now? Are we ready to do that? I'm throwing, I'm throwing a curveball at you. You're good. I got thumbs up. Would you like to see a video on the skinny on tithing real quick? Good. I, I would too. I haven't seen it yet.
something that was in the head. More like a smile on someone's face, case in point. We searched for pattern on the date night kind of thing, and uh, we got the use of spouse and girl romantic and stuff, and they were charging $25 for childcare. Boom! Hi, right there, okay? Here's the baby it wasn't sad. It was a sad guy. I got to spend $100 <laughs> on a rent that night, including dessert. My wife, with a little lobster there, with some white sauce around the chain, had a smile from ear to ear. That, my friend, has had enough for me. Okay, I guess that's the skinny. <laughs> Gentlemen, we need to receive this morning's title of the Army. I really don't know where to begin other than let's just pray. <laughs> no, we, we're on a, a series called The Blessed Life, and it has nothing to do with your money. It has everything to do with your heart. And today I'm going to be giving you a message on the fear of the Lord. And I hope we can disconnect from the whole money thing and move into the obedience the blessing and the favor and the anointing that God is lavishly wanting to pour on to all those that would seek Him first. Amen? 
So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we honor you, and as we give to you out of obedience and a cheerful heart this morning, bless our hands, bless our homes, and the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. across this place of Jesus is all that you have and all that you need would you just lift your hands and give him praise and glory this morning father we glorify your name we lift your holy name come on ladies and gentlemen we're here to worship God we're here to lift up the name of Jesus the name that's above every other name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord father we honor you here in this place we recognize your Holy Spirit is among us we feel you, and God, I thank you, Lord, that our emotions are connected to you, God. We don't have to sit here staunch and just 
only expect that our mind would be connected, but Lord, you've enabled us to engage fully to you, and I thank you for that. So God, I pray that you help us focus from this point on, that you watch over to, to, to brood over literally your word, to watch over and to protect and to perfect it in our lives so that we can leave here changed and better for it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. If you're excited to be here this morning, say amen. Amen. You can be seated right where you're at. I need you to get your Bible out with me. We love to, to get in the Word of God here at Faith, and I want to welcome all of our guests with us this morning. Very special day. We've got a lot of friends and family on vacation and all over the place, but I wanted to just extend a special thank you to all of you who came yesterday to uh, Patricia Beadle's promotion day, if you will, and supported Dwight and their entire family in that special moment. It was a, a tremendous gesture on many of your parts, and, and I just have to say that God was in all of it. And uh, it, if you have a chance, speak with Dwight. Let him share the story of kind of their journey in the last couple of moments in their life. It's just, it'll, it'll bless you to hear that. God is absolutely alive and at work in those that love him. He will not leave you. He's not going to ask you to walk through something that's too big for you. As a matter of fact, he shows himself in a very big way when you look for him. Amen? Last week, the Nash family was with us. Did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy the fireworks? Yes. Did you enjoy the barbecue? I think I heard, I heard great things. I was unable to be with you. I had to uh, travel to California. I was in a summit up there. We raised over $2 million for the publication of the Children's Fire Bible. Amen? That will be in two different translations, the NIV for a national translation. The international translation will be the New King James Version. There's specific reasons to that, but it is a spirit-filled emphasis Bible that is for our children. We've got Translations going all over the world for various languages that need them. We have the, the Teenager's Fire Bible. We had yet to publish the Children's Fire Bible, so that was the emphasis while I was there, and I want to just thank you for giving me the privilege of doing that. Two weeks ago, we talked about the principle of firsts. I hope somebody learned something that day that God is asking us to consecrate. You know, we have fun with these little videos, and we talk about tithing, we talk about giving. I hope it ruffles your feathers a little bit because, you know, we're not supposed to talk about each other's money. I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about God's money. I'm just telling you that there is a plan for you, and God has set before us a very clear direction. And I talked to you about the principle of first two weeks ago and how God himself consecrated his first in the Lamb of God his son Jesus. There was a sacrifice and then there was a redeeming that takes place when you consecrate first. And that's what the Bible speaks of all the way through the Old Testament. God did this through Jesus because the Lamb of God was sacrificed. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I have the privilege of being the redeemed, the church. Amen. So that's why we teach the principle of first. If you'll set aside that first that 10%, God says, consecrate that to me, then the blessing and the miracle of his redemptive work becomes reality over what's left. It's amazing, but you have to do it, and here's, here's the deal. We talk about tithe, we talk about 10th, and you're like, well, I've got 100 bucks, I'm gonna spend 90, and I'm gonna give 10. The way God did it is he gave his son first. He did that by faith before you and I have ever had the chance of saying we accept him as Lord and Savior. He did that and consecrated that sacrifice that first by faith, then the redemptive work began. If you'll trust God with the first of your 10%, if you'll give him that first, then you'll see the redemptive work happen. Before you even know you got enough, he'll begin to multiply that over and over and over. And it says, heaven will be open to you with that so full you can't even contain the blessings of God. Now, we've talked about money. I want to talk about the blessing, living the blessed life. How many of you choose to live the blessed life this morning? Half of you. How many before you leave are going to decide, at least think about living the blessed life? <laughs> you better raise your hand because here at Faith, we choose to live the blessed life. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 33. Put your hand in Isaiah chapter 33, and then I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Isaiah 33 and Hebrews chapter 12. Two primary scriptures that we'll reference this morning. There's a ton of other scriptures. I can't expect you to get there fast enough, so please... Uh, feel free to look up and see the screens in front of you. We'll try to provide those as we go along. There's such a thing as healthy fear, ladies and gentlemen. I know we don't like to talk about fear, but there's a such thing as healthy fear. As a matter of fact, the church today, Christians today, many people, you know, just talking about the fear of the Lord this morning puts you in a level, an elite, so to speak, and in a small group, the minority of those on earth. No one likes to talk about the fear of the Lord. 
When, when are you ever hearing about the fear of the Lord? As a matter of fact, a lot of the major translations that are coming out, the newer ones, don't even say the word fear. They're choosing other words, and that's, that's a tragic mistake, and we'll see that in a little bit. But here at Faith, we choose to live a blessed life, and here's why. Two weeks ago, I gave you a scripture in Deuteronomy. It says, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Do you remember that scripture? There's a choice. You can choose a blessing or you can choose a curse. Let me give it to you in another way that might resonate better with you. Jesus spoke this and it was penned in Matthew chapter 7 that in verse 13 and 14 it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find that. That's a choice. There is a broad road that a lot of people are going to think that's the easy route. There is a narrow road that few are going to go, but they'll find life there. And that's a choice, amen? You've got a choice to choose blessing, or you've got a choice to choose the curse. You have a choice to follow after everybody else in the curse, or you've got a choice to walk the narrow road that God puts before you that few will follow, and in that road, there's life. This life is full of choices, and God is making it very, very clear. And when it comes to the fear of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, the blessing that comes through that, you'll find that it's also a choice. The fear of the Lord is not something to be afraid of. It's not something to, to, to despise either. Instead, it's God's treasure that he is sharing with his people. How many of y'all like treasure? <laughs> okay, yeah, Chaco, man, I appreciate your honesty. You're the only one that raised their hand. You've probably watched National Treasure, haven't you? One and two. You probably DVR'd it, didn't you? And you watched it over and over and over. It's okay to admit it. I've done the same. I like treasure. I think it's cool. There's just a mystic kind of thing about it. It's a, mis it's a mystery. There's an author I was reading, and he said, you know, uh, he says, I, I, I once asked myself why uh, this jewel in Isaiah 33. Let's read it together. He says, he will be the sure foundation for the times, a rich source of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. For the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. The, the New King James Version says, wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Man, growing up, I loved looking for things that I would call treasure. When I went to the lake with my parents, I would look for the, the mysterious, if I could just find in a cedar tree, uh, an arrowhead. Anybody ever done that, looking cedar trees, looking for arrowheads? Flint rock, moon rock, those little geo rocks you break open, they look like crystals. You ever walk the beaches looking for shark's teeth? For sand dollars? Yeah, treasure. It, you feel like you're a hunter. You feel like you know, you're out in the wild and, you're, and it's the adventure before you. We're just kind of drawn to the whole idea of a treasure. So when the Bible speaks of God's treasure, man, this should, guys especially, should light, your, light up your world a little bit. God has a treasure, and in that treasure I have access. Look, if treasures like national treasure are so big and, and, and there's a Mayan community or there's an underworld that's just all gold and everybody's looking for it. If you can think of, of that man's idea could create something like that, think about the God of the universe. The God that spoke life into existence and, and scattered the stars into the universe and named them and knows them by name and moves them on schedule. Don't you think when he says he has a treasure, that should just perk our little interest a little bit. It does for me. Let, me. let me read this quote to you. It says, I want to ask myself, why was this jewel of truth in Isaiah 33 um, tacked at the end of this verse in Isaiah. And I came to the conclusion that it was tacked on so subtly because God wants us to search for truth. Jesus said that we should search the scriptures for them. Uh, we should search the scriptures for in them we will find the truth about him. And that's John chapter 5. I think what God is, is wanting is he's curious if we're really turning to the word of God and diligently searching for truth. Because those of you that will diligently search for truth in the word of God. He says therein lies a treasure that's his treasure that's available for you and me. But we're gonna have to talk about how do we get to that treasure. Um, many of us are afraid of what God might say if we were to approach him and ask him, you know, what do you feel about us and, and what is this whole fear concept? But I want you to look in Psalms chapter 19, verse nine. It says, the fear of the Lord is pure. It's enduring. It's enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord 
are sure and altogether righteous. The key word I want you to underline, I want you to highlight there is forever. The fear of the Lord is pure. That word pure is also translated in in a very unique way, clean, unmixed, unalloyed. That's like a refining process. It almost sounds like gold, treasure, doesn't it? The purest of gold is the most valuable treasure. So there's a treasure in the fear of the Lord. And basically what he's saying there is everyone that has anything to do with God, those that live for God, even eternally, whether you're here or angelic, so to speak, the fear of God will be a part of your life if you walk for the Lord, if you walk in him. Now, if you go into Proverbs chapter 27, it gives us another perspective. Don't let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Another translation you may have in front of you says, uh, fear the Lord all the day. So now you've got this thing where God is saying, the fear of the Lord needs to be something that endures forever. It's going to be a part of everybody's life, whether you're here or whether you're there. It's never going to change. There will always be an element of the fear of the Lord within you. And that's going to be an enduring thing, an eternal thing. But he also says, now practically, this should be something that you have as at least a a thought in your mind every single day, I should have the fear of the Lord all the day long. So if if you think about it, you know, Paul says you need to pray without ceasing. And you need to be prayerfully minded at least at some point during the day that God is alive and he's your savior and he's your provider, right? Right? Well, here's another twist on that. There is a treasure in God, and he speaks of it through the fear of the Lord. And he says, this is something that will forever be, and I expect you to have the fear of the Lord all the day long. I don't know if you've thought about the fear of the Lord lately, but this is something God expects you to have all day long. Now, I need to tell you what the fear of the Lord is not before we get into what it actually is. So there's a couple of things that if you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The fear of the Lord is not a natural fear. You know, there are studies that say babies have two fears, a fear of noise and a fear of falling. Is that true? I don't know. But uh, maybe if you could ask a baby and they could respond to you. But that's what the experts say. I think we pick up more fears along the way. Like when you go to Six Flags and get on Excalibur, you're like nudging your buddy and go, are you going to raise your hand? I don't know. Are you going to raise your hand? I don't know. Until the time comes and you're usually like this when the picture's taken going... Only the cool people go like this, and they've got the thing that goes over you now. You can only go like this. You can't really do that anymore like you could on Grease Lightning here. But anyways, natural fear is not what the Bible is speaking of as the fear of the Lord, nor is a phobia. Now, you can think of any phobia. Phobias are are a controlling element of your life, and it, it, it basically it's a tormenting thing. So if you've got any kind of phobia happening in your life, like if you're afraid of getting into an elevator, Small spaces, dark places, heights, phobias. That's not what the Bible is speaking of as the fear of the Lord. Those are, those are tormenting things. And as a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 1.7, the Word of God says, God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, as some of your Bibles say, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You can't have a clear conscience or a clear mind when phobias are controlling your emotions, can you? You can't. I mean... Uh, there, I know people that can't get into an MRI because they're just too claustrophobic. They can't do it. They have to be sedated before they do it. That's a phobia. That's not the fear of the Lord that we're talking about. Here. As a matter of fact, in 1 John 4, 18, it says there's no fear in love. And we know, what is God? God is love. There's no fear, that kind of fear in love. But perfect love casts out all fear because fear involves torment. We're not talking about a tormenting fear. The fear of the Lord is not a natural fear. It's not a phobia or a tormenting fear. The fear of the Lord is, is not a religious fear. Now, this is, this is what I want to uh, clarify here. It's not a religious fear taught by men. Religious fears generate hypocrisy. Anybody know what a hypocrisy is? Don't nudge your neighbor and don't look at your spouse. Look straight ahead. I will save you a lot of pain. Religious fear makes people act or role play. This is, this is something that we see all too often in the church. And many times, men deal with this more than women. And we talk about this, we, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, didn't we guys, in our band of brothers. If you come on Sunday nights, you can be a part of our men's ministry, kind of this, this, this time where we're setting aside for just the men. It's called Band of Brothers. We're trying to get together and dialogue, what is this life as a man of God, and how can we become better and stronger as a unit, and then move forward in strengthening our homes through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we talked about this. We often come in thinking we have to be a certain way, or we got to present ourselves in a certain way, or we'll be looked down on, or we'll be less than a true man of God. That's, that's a fear that's not the fear of the Lord. That is a religious fear, and it's taught by men. We've seen it before, how people act a certain way at work or on the job or at home, and then 
when they come in, they actually are asked to pray. And, you know, we're talking like this. We're talking in a normal tone. We're talking like we're normal people. And all of a sudden, you ask them to pray over the meal or something. They go, Our Father! <laughs> oh, God. Dramatic pause. Dramatic pause. <laughs> that's an act. That's a show. That's not who they are. Who they are, were, that's, that was the person you were talking to. When, when, when you ask somebody to pray and they say, you know, yeah, I'd love to. And they begin to pray and share and it just comes out of the heart. That's who they are. It's not a show. A religious fear is not the fear of the Lord. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah 29, it says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're putting on a show. They want everyone else to see them and everyone else matters but me. This is how it goes on. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by man. So religious fear taught by man. That's what we're talking about. Is not the fear of the Lord that you need to be focused on. And that is certainly not the treasure of God. Matthew 15 also says, You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, with their hearts. They are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by man. So the fear of the Lord that we're looking for is not... Religious fear taught by man, okay? It's not a set of rules, it's not a facade, it's not putting on a mask, it's not this big masquerade. Lastly, the fear of man is not the fear of the Lord. This is something I think we all get caught up in, don't we? This is called uh, by scripture as a snare. When you walk into a place and you're more concerned about what other people think about you than what God thinks about you, that's a snare. We all fall victim to that. We get up and we dress a certain way. Why do you think? It's because you, you think you feel better in how you look. No, you're looking like this because you care about how other people feel about you, right? God created you like Adam and Eve, and he said, you're good enough as you are, but now we've got to clothe ourselves with other things because we're worried about how other people f- will see us, right? Don't read Ezekiel. It'll mess you up if you hear what God made this guy do. It'll just absolutely mess you up. That's a challenge. We'll talk about that maybe another time. Anyways, moving on. Uh, Proverbs calls this a snare because the fear of man is opposite of the fear of the Lord and you become more concerned about people than you do the concerns of God. So we know what now the fear of the Lord is not. Now let's move into what the fear of the Lord is. This is profound. If you've got your pen, hold it with two hands. I want you to write this down. The fear of the Lord is a fear. Glad some of y'all got that. In Hebrews, here's your second chapter. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21. The sight was so terrible that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. When Moses was in the presence of God and the glory of God began to resound about him, whether it was through voice, tangibly through the crowd, uh, through the cloud, or whether it was inscripting uh, the commandments on, 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 on a stone form and laying them before him, the presence of God was so powerful and so rich that literally Moses said it was so overwhelming that he trembled, literally in his boots as we call it. You're trembling in your boots. If Moses, I would think this guy had a pretty close relationship with God. I think he saw some incredible things in his life, correct? I think he saw the hand of God miraculously open the water so that the Israelites could walk through. I know he struck the rock as God commanded him to and water came out. That was a miracle. I know that manna and quail and all of these things, a fire by night and a cloud by day and all of these miracles and and the plagues in Egypt. Moses had had an inside track to who God was. But when God revealed himself to Moses, it says it was so terrifying, so to speak, it was so much, so overwhelming, that he began to tremble in his boots. I wonder, I wonder, is there a fear of the Lord that is there among, in us, in our hearts, that we literally get to the place where we're trembling, literally, in our boots when he speaks to us? When we are in his presence, is there a holy reverence or a type of awe that is inspiring us to just want to be there. It is a fear, but I need to define this fear. There's nothing in the Bible that suggests that the fear of the Lord is unnecessary or an option. I don't, I don't always have you look at your neighbor and say certain things, but I want you to say something with me. First of all, say this, I choose the blessing. If you're here this morning, what is being taught to you is a choice of the blessing, okay? So we choose here at Faith to be blessed. There was a curse and a blessing. We chose a blessing. There is a narrow road and a wide road. We chose the narrow road. It is a choice. The fear of God is not an option. The Bible says it's not not an option. It's a choice. And here's what we have to do. We have to make this our choice. 
In order for me to kind of explain this to you, I've got a couple of illustrations. This last week I said I was at this Fire Bible Summit, and they had us in Monterey, California, and they had us at Pebble Beach Golf Course, where they played the U.S. Open. Any golfers in the house? Three of you? <laughs> or are you just mad at me because I got to play and you didn't? Sorry. We're out there. We, made, we raised $2 million, okay? They let us play golf. So we're out there, and I'm standing on the bluff overlooking hole number eight. Remember that one, the little par three? And then number eight, that goes this way. Well, you, you have to tee off, and you tee off to the edge of the cliff. And as you get to the edge of the cliff, there's no rope, there's no railing, there's nothing. Straight down, ragged, uh, jagged rocks, all the way down. They call it a bluff. I call it a cliff. It was scary. I mean, it's beautiful, but one step in the wrong direction, you're going to be dashed against the rocks and hurled into the sea, so to speak. But as I turned this way, I noticed as I looked up number 14, which is the par 5 where J Dustin Johnson and all those guys just blew up, and I, I could see the rolling fairway. It was too beautiful really to explain other than there's multi-million dollar real estate all the way up this thing, and it's just so beautiful. It's a once-in-a-lifetime deal. We're out there walking. There's history. There's all this stuff happening, and so on one side, I can see something exhilarating to me. It's overwhelming. It's beautiful, but yet I know if I were to take just one step in this direction, it could mean the end of me. The fear of the Lord is something similar to that. When you're in his presence, you know it's just so, it's so exhilarating. It's too, it's, it's too much. There's wor words can't explain or express to you how it really feels to be in his presence. You want to be there. You long to be there. And you sense this is a now moment. This is a once in a lifetime moment. But because you're with God, because he's holy and you're not, and you've, made, you've been made righteous through the blood of the lamb, not of your own work. So you know you're there by gift. You're standing there and you know it, it just takes one step. One little move, whatever, because God is who he is and we're who we are, it, we could be non-existent. And that's why Isaiah would fall on his face and say, woe is me. That's why Jeremiah would do the same. That's why all he, Moses would say, I'm trembling in my boots, literally. Well, he had sandals. I was, I was trembling in my sandals. Make it relevant. <laughs> why would he say that? Because there's something so awe-inspiring and so reverent about who God is. But yet there's something so terrifying and trembling. You, you'd, you'd begin to tremble because it's like there is certain death, yet here is certain life. And that's who God is. Let me give you another example. I took the, uh, I took the men with me to Arizona. I, I go every year to, uh, to the Indian Reservation and we plant a church there. It's just what we do in our men's ministry and we have had the privilege of doing that every single year. And two years ago we went, we were in the northern part of Arizona in Tuba City and it's just about an hour and a half from an area of uh, the Grand Canyon where you can go and you can see the Grand Canyon. I'd never gone, we had a couple of hours on Wednesday, we'd finished our work and we decided we're going to go for it. So we went there and I, I've seen pictures, I've seen movies, I kind of had an idea, I've seen postcards that, you know, this is going to be awesome. The sight, it's just going to be too much to take in visually. Well, I didn't realize how awesome it really was. I mean, you let, they let you walk out to the edge, so to speak, and look down, and it's two miles to the bottom. Two miles to the bottom, and that's the Colorado River kind of cruising through there. And you're just sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm a guy, I'm a baseball player, so I was looking at it. <laughs> I'm a guy. My wife, you just watch my wife from time to time. She slips lower and lower in the seat. I know that she's my barometer, the thermometer there, but I got to get back on track. I'm looking at how awesome this is. I've already spit off the cliff. It's overwhelming to me. But my heart's pounding because I don't like heights to begin with. I know, I just don't. But I know it just, that one step is the end of me. I'm five o'clock news. I'm on their wall as one of the many that have done something silly out there that close, but yet I'm surrounded by such a majestic view that you can't even really take it in. Your, your eyes, it makes you get a headache. You get kind of sick at your stomach because you're, you're combing this whole thing. It's just too much. All of it's coming into your brain. There's just not enough room to absorb it. Does that make sense? It's awesome. When it comes to the fear of the Lord, that's what I want you to, to consider. It's what I want to, to place within your heart as, as the definition of the fear of the Lord. It's so overwhelmingly awesome. It's too much for you to take in. It almost makes you sick trying. But even in the midst of all of that, you know you're right on the edge of your very existence when you're in his presence. Because he's holy and you're not. 
And it's only because of the blood of the Lamb that you're even given that privilege to stand next to Him and to be in His presence. But aren't you glad He's sacrificed and now you walk in the redeeming grace of the blood of Christ. That's the principle of first. That's how you figure out, am I walking the blessed life? Well, are you in the blood of the Lamb first? Now you become a part of the redeemed. You become a part of His church. And now you learn to choose the fear of the Lord. Now that we know what the fear of the Lord is, let me just kind of bring you into an area that I think is very, very important. We emphasize here a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are God, one, of, one in three. And that God the Father is, he's omnipotent, all power, powerful. He, he possesses everything and it's all within him. But you know Jesus, he was in the garden. He said, nevertheless, not my will but yours. How do you explain that? And then how do you explain that they're separate? Well, very easy, one more, deference. Not difference, but deference. Deference is the key word to understanding the Trinity as it is taught in that way. Meaning they are all one, equal in power, equal in ability, equal in substance, equal in one, yet submissive to one. Jesus was in deference to God. He was submissive to the will of his Father, yet he had everything the Father had. And in him we live and move and have our being, so in, therefore we are a part of him and in him. Amen? That's how this thing works. But I have to tell you that the only way you're going to comprehend the fear of the Lord is to know and have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a few questions. You can answer yes or no in a resounding way. Are you ready? Can you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Is he a person? Is he weird? Are people weird? Thank you. The Holy Spirit's not weird. He is not to be feared. He is not to be shunned or treated as though he's a stepchild of God the Father. He is God himself. He is fully clothed and embodied in God himself. When you say, I don't want the work, the person, or the, the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're saying, I only want a part of God. I don't want all of you. The Word of God makes it very clear the Holy Spirit is God. And He is sent by, the, by God Himself to be our comforter, our leader, and our guider right now. He comes alongside you to steer you in so that you can, your heart and your mind can intersect the will of the Father. Don't you want to know what the will of God is for your life? You need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guides you into all truth and will help you. It will help, he'll guide your life to intersect the will and the mind of it. He's the only one. The Bible says, if you want to know the mind and the will of God, know the Holy Spirit. So there's nothing to be afraid of when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And the only way you're going to comprehend the fear of the Lord is by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the only person that knows the mind and the will of the Father. In Exodus chapter 20, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. It's one of the commandments. It can also be translated, you shall have no other gods beside me. Having the fear of the Lord is really the same thing, basically, as obeying the first of the Ten Commandments. Nothing in front of, nothing above, nothing more important, nothing taking more of your time. There should be nothing in this life that should be more or more valuable than your walk with the Lord. And it's hard to, to put that into perspective because you've got to get up, you've got to get dressed, you've got to eat your breakfast, get your kids ready, get out the door and go to work. It takes up a large portion of your day. You've got to come home, you've got to... Cook the meal, you got to get the kids ready for, you know, the next day at school, getting the homework done and all this stuff. Look, your, your day's spread out. But God is saying you need to live every single moment of every day with the fear of the Lord in your heart. Therein lies a treasure that will yield a blessing to you that's far beyond what you'll ever know, comprehend, or even conceive. Because you can't know me like I am. Not yet. But in the midst of that, you need to know just how close you are in my presence. And here's how we do that. We do that by knowing the Holy Spirit. In Psalms 34, verse 11, it says this, Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever, you, whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. We need to be taught the fear of the Lord. First, it's a choice. I choose the fear of the Lord in my life. Secondly, we need to be taught. Now that we've chosen it, we need to be taught. Now, one of the motivational treasures of God is that if we allow the Holy Spirit to teach us the fear of the Lord, uh, then the implication is that we're going to have life and a long time to enjoy it. I think we would appreciate that, don't you? Watching our kids grow, and I, don't want, I want the Lord to come back before my daughter turns 16. 
So I'm sorry if your plans are that you would grow old and have a long, prosperous life. I'm sorry. I'm really praying for like 10 years from now. <laughs> Out of here. I don't want to deal with, with her uh, driving. I don't want to deal with boyfriends. I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. Okay? That's just my prayer, and I'm sticking to it. <sighs> Let me ask you, does your speech reflect the fear of the Lord? Because it says there, the Holy Spirit will teach us. However, if you love life and desire to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. How are you, how are you speaking? Are you speaking in the fear of the Lord? Or are you doing what Proverbs 3, 7? Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Okay? One thing that bo the Bible makes very, very clear is this. Evil and fear do not mix. Okay? Evil and the fear of the Lord do not mix. What does that mean? Evil and the fear of the Lord are like water and oil. We see that in, in, in our little oil spill that's happening, the major oil spill that's happening. They don't mix. It's going to land somewhere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make a mess. It's like California weather and my wife. They don't mix. Let me explain. My wife, would per she didn't go to the beach one day with me. Not one day. It was 58 degrees or something like that. It's freezing cold. She would rather sit in the lobby and watch the beautiful ocean out there because there was a fireplace and she could sit there and watch that. Isn't that cool? Yes. <laughs> so I was the one that went down and, and I enjoyed the, the everything else. But the, the coolest part about that, I got sidetracked. The coolest part about that is that my daughter called and she said, Dad, what are you going to bring us home? Because we always try to bring something home, a little t-shirt or something cheap. Now, it's cheap. And she goes, well, I have something I want. And I go, well, tell me. I, I want a really, 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 really big pebble. I'm at Pebble Beach. You want a pebble. It makes perfect sense. So what we did for the entire time, I thought that was the cutest thing ever. Uh, as I went down to the water and I, I got pebbles, <laughs> and I stuck them in my wife's purse, and she got checked at the, uh, the security thing. What are these, ma'am? Rocks? Yes, rocks. Interesting. Could you stand over here? <laughs> Let me bring this thing to a close. Job 28. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. I'm going to give you a principal part to this in close. And, and, and there's, these are three scriptures back to back. I want you to write them down and then we'll, we'll put this thing together. In Psalms 111, 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How many want to be wise in your dealings here on earth? You want to be wise with how, first of all, you handle your own personal life, how you handle your home, your relationships, your job. Wisdom is powerful. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. The word beginning can also be translated the principal part. So, it's the basis and the foundation of all wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the principal part of wisdom. Do you get that? If you want wisdom in your life, it, you first must have the fear of the Lord at work in your life. It's the principal part. It's the beginning. In Proverbs 1, 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We've talked. We want wisdom. How many want to know and have knowledge? <laughs> How many want to know what's going on? Yeah, I do. I, I certainly do. I don't want to dis engage my mind to this whole process of life. I don't want to be led emotionally into anything. I want to process it. I want to know the word. I want to test the word. I want to go into it and have an understanding, a wisdom, first of all, to have the understanding, and then a knowledge with that understanding to make my decisions. And so here, here again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So the fear of the Lord is the principal part. Again, you can translate it that way. The fear of the Lord is the principal part of knowledge. And lastly, in Proverbs 9, 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So the fear of the Lord develops wisdom, understanding, and finally, knowledge. And when you see that these things come together, you know how powerful the fear of the Lord is and why God says specifically it's an eternal thing. It's not ever going to go away. And secondly, it should be a part of every single day of your life. Fear of the Lord. And if we've never thought about it, just think of the treasure we're missing in the blessings of God. If you've never thought about the fear of the Lord, how then would you have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of who he is? It'd be very difficult, wouldn't it? And how then would you have that relationship with the Holy Spirit, the one that was sent to comfort you, to guide you into all truth, to be there for you and with you until Jesus returns? Would you stand with me? To know the Lord's will is to have chosen the blessed life, and to have chosen the blessed life is to have enjoyed the greatest treasure ever discovered, 
It begins with a personal invitation, and that invitation is, do you know Jesus? Will you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your presence. What a privilege it is to know that, God, there is a blessed life out there. And the blessing that we're, we're desiring is the knowledge of why you say blessed the knowledge and definition of blessing in, in your word. It has nothing to do with monetary gain or means. It has everything to do with the fear of the Lord in our life. Submission, Father, in a relationship in the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for this truth, that wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. These are treasures that we can draw from, but it all begins, first off, the principal part, the beginning part of any of those things your word says very specifically is the fear of the Lord. I have to ask, do we have your fear in our, in our life, that reverence, that holy, awesome fear? God, being in your presence, not being able to even take all of it in, but yet having somewhat of a trembling thing happening within our spirit, knowing that, God, we are so close to the very end of us when we're in your presence because you're so pure. You're so amazing and so holy. The things of this life that we drag to these altars, God, are so insignificant when we look at how holy you are. But in our world, they mean everything. Give us the courage, Lord, to find our way into your presence. If you're in here this morning and Jesus is not someone you know in a personal way, however, you've experienced fear in this life, and it's been one of the four things that's not the fear of the Lord, and you're ready to experience the fear of the Lord, the reverence, the awesome holy fear of the Almighty God. It starts with the invitation of who Jesus is because it's by the blood of the Lamb that you're redeemed. And it's in that redemption, and these are big words, but you're bought with that blood. You're purchased back to God. And with that purchase, enables you to walk in these blessings. The blessing is just that you get to know Him. And that through knowing Him, you be, you'll have the wisdom you need, the knowledge and the understanding to make this life a valuable journey you here this morning and you need to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed is between you and God. And I just need to recognize that your hand is up so we can pray for you this morning. Would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to know Jesus today. I don't want to leave until I know him. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's a part of my life. Anybody in here? Glory to you, man, Jesus. Thank you, man, for your courage. Anybody else would raise your hand and say, Pastor, today is the day I just have to know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Anybody? Thank you. In the, thank you. You can put your hands down. You've been recognized. And basically, this is what's going to happen. We're going to say a prayer. I can't say this prayer for you. The Word of God says that if you'll confess, just make it a verbal thing in your life that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life. Here's the, here's the deal. The Word of God says if you'll acknowledge Him as dying on the cross and God raising Him from the dead, which means He's alive, that means He can come into your heart. If you'll just confess that He's alive and can come into your heart today is the day of your salvation. Those of you that raise your hand, would you pray with me and everyone in this place? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for being who you are. God, it is an absolute privilege and the, 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 the pinnacle of our existence is to know you as Lord and Savior of our life. And those that raised their hand today, God, are making a commitment. They did this and it was a courageous act amongst their friends and maybe in an unfamiliar place. They said, God, I'm not leaving here until I know your son Jesus because recognizing he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I can't live without him. I'm not leaving here without him. So Father, I just pray that their prayer is heard in the courts of heaven and lord that there's the greatest party happening right now as the word of god says that that all heaven stands still knowing that one has come to you lord and lord we just pray father that this is made a reality in their life we confess you as lord of our life we believe that you're an alive god you're not an image you're not something that we pay tribute to we know you because we're known by you and it's because of that relationship now that we have eternal life through the blood of Jesus. I thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Father, I just ask, also pray over all of those folks that are here. The fear of the Lord is not something that we often talk about. But there has to be somewhat of a reverent awe within our spirit. Or God, we're just going to miss so much in this life. The blessed life is the, the life lived in the fear of the Lord. The blessed life is not the life in the fear of man, in the fear of phobias or controlling issues, uh, of, of religious fear of what men teach, has nothing to do with that. It's not getting bullied uh, by anything. It's knowing in whom we have our trust and in whom we believe. 
and knowing who is the author and the finisher of our faith. God, let us have a moment where we stand on the edge of our very existence and see you for who you are. God, give us as men the ability to see you so that we can articulate this to our children. God, we need to be able to speak life into them. We need to be able to speak truth and let them see just how awesome you are and just how holy you are, God. And without the blood of Jesus, we wouldn't have that privilege. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody say it with me. Amen. Would you have a seat right where you're at? I, I, I need to do this just so that you can see. We're going to receive communion. It'll just take two or three minutes for us to be served. And I would like for the section leaders that have been assigned, would you stand and let everyone in your section know who you are? Okay. What we're going to do is this entire section on the left, if you wouldn't mind, what we're going to do is we're going to follow out your leader. You'll stand and you'll go right out to the left and you'll circle around. You'll be served and then you'll come back the other side of your pew and everyone, when we're all served, will take communion together. Those in the back sections, you have your leaders in front of you. So those of you guys who are leaders, you'll walk through and serve. I love you guys. In just a few minutes, if you would, please stand and let's follow the person in front of us and we'll serve communion. you mind if there's anybody that was unable to walk and make the journey to serve him, please?
if you would stand with me, please. Father, we stand again in awe and reverence of who you are. That you would know and have the wisdom and the knowledge and the understanding that we would stand before you as sinners needing a Savior. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for the sacrifice and the passion. It's something I can't conceive or even understand really in my own. But I thank you that you've given me this life to try to understand. We stand before you as humble individuals, God, that love you. And ask that you bless these elements in Jesus' name. The word of God says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you hold the bread up, please? Jesus, this represents your body. The description of everything that's described as to what you endured is overwhelming. But the thing that resonates in me the most is the fact that you said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. That was a choice. And by your example, I've made a choice today to say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Teach me to walk in your ways. Teach me to love you as you love. Teach me to be a voice as you were the voice. So I love you, Lord. Let us eat. the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat and drink this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes will we hold the cup up please a small symbol Lord of a huge sacrifice this represents your blood and it represents a covenant as Hebrews says a new covenant a better way and it's through you I thank you that I live on the other side of this veil. I live on the other side of this new covenant, Lord, and I didn't have to experience anything but your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I want to just thank you for the lives that came to know you today. And I want to thank you for the lives that have so faithfully and diligently served you the best they know how. God, may your blood through the, your son Jesus be the redemptive work, the completed work that enables us an eternal place with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's drink. Now can you for just a moment proclaim within yourself, within who you are, everything that the scripture means to you. Father, we proclaim within our lives your death and your resurrection through Jesus Christ. We thank you that the blood is a redeeming work, the sacrificial work, the completed work. That there is, there, there, it's without spot, it's without blemish, and we don't ever have to approach you, God, wondering if we're good enough. You said the lamb was good enough, therefore I'm good enough. And I thank you for that promise. I thank you, God, that I've got the understanding and the wisdom and the know-how today that I will leave and I will try to live in the fear of the Lord every single day of my life. I will recognize that it's, it's here and it's eternal. It'll, it'll be a part of who I am forever. And God, I also recognize that it's your treasure. God, may we enjoy your treasure while we're here on earth as we walk in the fear of the Lord. May we walk in the wisdom and the understanding of who you are. We know in part and we'll know it all then. But until then, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would then be our guide to a submissive life, an attitude and a choice to love you and to serve you all the days of our life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Roger, would you please close us? Amen. That's some good eating, huh? That's some good eating. The word of God is the bread of life. And so, man, that was some good eating. I want to, I want to bless you with a prayer as we go, and then you can have a chance to greet Pastor uh, out in the foyer. Uh, but let's pray together. I want to pray a blessing of you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to worship and to celebrate together as a family, to love you. Uh, Lord God, we are just so blessed by you and your presence. God, thank you for receiving our praise. And thank you for speaking to us through your word, uh, the truths, Lord God, of the fear that we need to have 
have of you, God. It's not a natural fear. It's a fear where, where uh, like Pastor described, that it's just we're in awe and, and, and humbly coming to you, Jesus. And we thank you so much for that. And God, we also thank you for the chance to receive of, of the bread and the juice, Lord, representing what you've done for us on the cross. And we walk now out of this building in victory and in the life that you give in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we say our motto together? Can we say it? Love God, love people, and love life. We love you guys. Hope to see you back here tonight. God bless.